name is Reverend Chantel Washington, and I am the pastor teacher here. We are so glad to be in service together again, in person, socially distanced, and remotely. And so I have a few brief announcements, and, uh, and we shall begin. The first thing that I'd like to announce, which is kind of almost silly for me to say, but we've postponed our outdoor service. <laughs> We're indoors and we wanted to err um, on the side of safety and caution and not potentially get rained on, especially with our equipment and our people and, you know. So, um, so we opted to be indoors today. We'll do it. We'll make a new day to be outdoors for worship and, and we're going to that. So we're glad you're here. We're indoors. We're glad we have a safe place to be inside in case it does rain. And um, I also want you to know that if you have not been vaccinated, we ask that you continue to wear your mask. If you have been vaccinated, you have the option to wear a mask or not. And, um, and those of you who choose to wear masks in solidarity with those who have not been vaccinated, that's a wonderful thing also. And so um, what we do ask is that when it's time to stand and sing together, that um, everyone affix their mask for the same uh, just as we still err on the side of caution. So um, I do want to tell you one more thing. Uh, we have a new baby. <laughs> we have a new baby. The Fordham family has welcomed their newest grandchild. The Ashley family has welcomed their newest baby, their brand new first baby girl. And uh, we're just so elated that um, everything has gone just as expected. Mom and baby are home safely and dad and they're surrounded by their loving family. And we're just so thankful for um, this church family who have been lifting up prayers for them and, um, and ask that you continue to pray for their new bonding experiences. And so we're so grateful and congratulations. There's a card on the table. And there, there actually are a couple of cards on the table. And so as you go out, um, we ask that you take a look. And if uh, you are led, please sign those cards so that we can get them off to uh, the various people in our, our church family who we'd like to give some hospitality to. We do have a couple of other people who um, we want to give some love and attention to by way of a card. So thank you for that. Um, please make sure that you see them out there. Uh, and finally, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, on life's journey, you are welcome here. Let us know. Both of you, please stand us for me. We gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, members of God's family and brothers and sisters to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. There are no outsiders here among us. No one has any special standing for praying Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For we have been brought together by the redeeming love of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Please prepare to gather to sing the song, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. It is listed in your bulletins. I ask that you would affix your masks if you have them and join in worship and song.
freedom you have given us through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son. But we confess today that we often live like slaves. Instead of living like you delight in us, we avoid you in shame and guilt. Instead of receiving your favor as a gift, we try to earn it with our effort. Instead of accepting your freedom, we prefer our chain. Instead of pursuing your purposes, we cling to our short-sighted agenda. Forgive us. Embrace us. Cleanse us. Heal us. We ask this in Jesus' name as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, you are the path of life, fullness of joy and pleasure evermore. So we can be confident of the truth. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. The Lord is my shepherd, and I know. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. He lets he leads my he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they go for me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint me my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Please stand as we sing together our song of the Lord for you. Jesus loves us. The words are in the
All my things are just for today because I really would like to read the story of Jesus' baptism before we engage in our baptism. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read it from the Gospel according to Matthew. And in Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17, this is what it says. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Amen. And so it is at this time we celebrate the way Jesus did the sacrament, the practice of baptism. And I invite uh, the whole family to come forward. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through this grace that we are participants of God's righteousness. When one receives the sacrament of baptism, they enter into the fellowship of Christ's holy family. present to you of this family, they are presenting their child today for Christian baptism. And since baptism is a sacrament, this is a sacred time in the life of these parents and this child and the community of faith. We believe that Christ gave this sacrament as a sign and a seal for a new covenant. This baptism signifies for this young child God's gracious acceptance. It is an acknowledgement of God's grace at work in the life of this child and with the care of her mother and father and extended family under the nurturing of this community of faith. Parents, do you desire your child to be baptized? The answer is we do. In presenting this child for baptism, you are hereby witnessing to your own personal Christian faith. Do you announce your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want to study, know, and love, and serve as a disciple, and that you want your child to do the same? The answer is, I do. To this end, it is your duty to teach her, as soon as she is able to learn the nature of this holy sacrament, to watch over her education, that she may not be led astray, to direct her feet to the sanctuary, to restrain her from evil associates and habits, and as much as in you are able to bring her up in the nurture and admonishment of the Lord. Will you nurture your child in Christ's church that by your teaching and example, Gabriella may be guided to accept God's grace for herself? The answer is, with God's help I know. Nurturing a child is not only the duty of the parents, but also the responsibility of grandparents, aunts, uncles, and the larger extended family. Do all of you, as members of this young lady's family, agree to offer her parents and her the love and care 
and to share in the responsibility for the physical and spiritual nurturing of Gabriella? If so, the answer is, I will. Parents, what is the full name of this child? Gabriella Rose, teacher, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. stand. Siblings of our faith community, we are the representatives that welcome Gabriella, but we also have responsibilities. People, will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this family and this Gabriella? into our care? Will you surround them with a community of love and forgiveness? Will you pray for them and extend Christian fellowship to them? The answer is, with God's help, we will. With God's help, we will. Gabrielle, you are now a part of a Christian community of faith that is bigger than race, bigger than gender, bigger than generations, and bigger than all the nations. We welcome you into this life and that you may give and receive God's graces. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for this gift of Gabrielle. It is our prayer that she will come to know the joy and suffering of being concerned about everyone she meets, that she will see each person worthy of dignity and acceptance. We pray for her a growth into fuller and deeper levels of humanity as she lives with the example of Jesus. We pray that she will understand that you alone can give life meaning and purpose and direction. O oh God, and that she will be on her knees before you with words of repentance and thanksgiving and on her feet for you with deeds of love. This is our prayer, and as we pray, we ask you to hear us. In Jesus' name, amen.
time of offering. It is the time that we give acknowledgement in our worship service to acknowledge that God has given us so many things, more things than we can count, and definitely more things than we can pay God back for. God doesn't ask for us to pay God back. God asks for us to give of what we have. And so we're so grateful that we have been able to continue to provide gifts to the church for um, whether it is in person, dropping them off, or sending them in the mail and putting them in the offering plate. We are working on some new ways of uh, giving and so soon we'll have more information on that. But in the meantime, continue to have a heart of giving. Continue to give a portion of what God has given to you in your times, treasures, and talents. Please stand for the God's salvation. Fix your maps and let us sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Thank you. 
scripture reading that I want to talk about is actually the first one that Diana beautifully read for us. It's one of those old faithfuls. I think it's one of the biggest old faithfuls around, the 23rd Psalm. Um, it came up in the lectionary, which as you know, I do sometimes and often use the lectionary, which is kind of like a schedule where the whole world has access to using the same three or four scripture verses all over the world. And I like using it because there are times when, you know, you can really feel the solidarity. There are people everywhere using these same verses. I think it's kind of cool. I don't do it every time. But I do do it often, and this week, the 23rd Psalm was in there. And so I thought it was wonderful for us to take a few minutes, even though many of us probably learned it by heart when we were little, and can say most of it, and some of us can still say all of it, depending on your memory and what your memory allows. Um, some people can say it in another language too, right? Um, but what I want to, uh, do is I want to talk about it because even though we learned it all that time ago, we still use it all the time. It's one of those things that it's used at many, many funerals. It's definitely used at nursing homes because people, even when they're not fully coherent and they hear it, have you ever seen someone who's kind of in a, a a state where they're not really communicating much anymore, and you read the 23rd Psalm and tear comes from their eyes because it's so familiar and it touches their heart. It's really, really a wonderful, wonderful um, set of Bible verses that David wrote. Um, it is a song, and, um, and I just want to talk about it a little bit and, and talk about where the comfort lies in this, in this set of verses because people get all kinds of comfort from it. Does anyone actually use it regularly in their life now? Show of hands. You don't have to raise your hand if you know. I saw a couple of hands. But I actually know people who read this every day. Sometimes they wake up in the morning before they even have coffee and just either recite or read the Psalms, the 23rd Psalms. So I'd like to read it again as a reminder and then we'll move forward. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So I wanted to start out reading it again as a reminder to uh, what we heard earlier. And when I close, I will read it again. Let's go back. I'm not going to talk about every line that would require us to be here for quite some time and I've seen it done and I've sat through it and it's beautiful but there are a couple of things that I really want to point out um, for us to really reflect on today I really want to talk about the restoration it says in Psalm 23 it says something about restoring us right and let's see Go through the whole thing just to find that line. <laughs> there it is. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And I want to talk about our souls being restored. Because I said last week, wow, God brought us through everything we've been through. And, you know, we had some head nods and some yeses. And we even had some Facebook um, affirmations as well. Thank you to our uh, our virtual congregationalists that are with us. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about being restored and what that looks like and, and, and how do we get restored when we don't even know how to ask for it sometimes. 
You know, when I think about my first thoughts about being restored and be, was being comforted, and um, and I had some time this weekend with my great nephew, my nephew's son. And one of the things that I learned was that, you know, he is a baby and he is one. He cries until he gets what he wants. <laughs> so, so we had to find ways to soothe him and thank God that he spoke, um, he speaks a little bit of sign language, so thank God uh, that Lexi speaks a little sign language so that we were able to help him feel soothed and restored. And it restored him back to a very calm state. That's where I wanted to get at. He doesn't take a pacifier, so that doesn't help him. And sometimes we are in places where we're upset, we're feeling senses of rejection, we're feeling senses of despair. In the last year, I'm sure many of us felt senses of isolation, a little bit of depression, a little bit of fear and anxiety. And how do we get back to that place? where we know that God restores our soul. It's not just a matter of just giving us what we need because in the first couple of lines it says that God gives us what we want. We lack nothing. God is our shepherd. And when we think about what shepherds do, they tend to the flock, yes, but they take care of them. And you know, I, I heard people say, have you ever heard people say, that sheep are dumb. Oh, I hate when I hear that. It makes me feel sad for the sheep. I don't know if they're really dumb or not, but I'm sure that that's not why over and over in the Bible we're, we as humans are referred to as sheep. <laughs> what I know is that sometimes sheep get overwhelmed. They eat more than they need to, and then they topple over. Has anyone ever seen that in real life? <laughs> oh, good. One person I saw, and maybe virtually, I don't know if any of you have, but I have not seen that. I have heard it. I actually may go and YouTube it later to see. But they say that sheep eat and eat and eat and overeat, boop, and top of the <laughs> It must be something to see. Their legs go straight up, and they can't do a thing, like a turtle, kind of. And they also tell me that when sheep have too much wool on them, they again, they topple over and they can't get up. That's why you have to go and take the sheep, the, the, uh, the wool off of the sheep at a certain point because it gets so big and so heavy, they, they get overwhelmed. And that's, that's partially what happens with us. I mean, we overeat sometimes, some of us, I don't know, I did in Vegas. <laughs> we, overindulge in different things. We look for other places to provide comfort when we really only need God, and we become overwhelmed. We become, we become overwhelmed with all kinds of things. I mean, little people become overwhelmed with grades, uh, new teachers, new classmates, new neighborhoods. The newness of things really overwhelms young people. Sometimes it overwhelms older people too. <laughs> but, um, but specifically in children going into fourth grade, they get overwhelmed and they need a sense of peace because they've done a lot of work to learn from kindergarten, sometimes pre-K, first, second, and third grade, they're learning all this stuff. They're learning letters, alphabets, phonics, numbers, computations, and then in the fourth grade, things shift and they have to use it. The lessons are not only to learn something, but to learn something and now remember what you learned and actually use it. That's why fourth and fifth grade is so nerve wracking for young people. And so what happens is, is in the first couple of months, it's all review. But by November, fourth graders get overwhelmed. Yeah. And the same things happen for grown-ups, but it's not fourth grade stuff, it's life's lessons, right? But we have a shepherd, God, who takes care of us in such an amazing way. So when we think about that shepherd and we think about those sheep, the sheep is, okay, remember, let's go back to the sheep being on its back, 
legs up in the air and can't do anything. Whether it's overeaten or it has too much wool on it, it's on its back, it's overwhelmed. Well, the shepherd comes along with his rod and his staff and he takes the hook of the staff and he grabs the legs of the sheep and nudges it until it can kind of come back over on its side and helps it up, right? And that's what God does for us. That's why they talk about, in the Bible, people like sheep, not the dumb part, but the other stuff too. There are so many different ways, but God is that shepherd. God is the person, God is the spirit, God is the thing, God is everything, right? Everywhere that we have access to, that we can count on to help us out, to help us up, to help us reconnect, to help us restore ourselves back into a calm place. When we listen to the words of the entire Psalm 23, we hear the different things that God talks about. God talks about bringing us to green pastures, um, making us to lie down in green pastures. Now that making us to lie down thing, I mean, some people don't like to be made to do anything, but busy people don't like to be made to be still. Is that right? Well, God knows that sometimes we need to rest. Sometimes we need to be still. Sometimes we need to lay down. Jesus gave us examples about needing rest. Jesus went to the back of the boat when they were going to the other side of the Galilee, right? And the other people, they panicked, they did all that other stuff. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Jesus knew Jesus in his human form needed to rest. God knew that we in our human forms need to rest. And when we think about God doing God's greatest work, dare I say God did some of God's greatest work, when Adam went to sleep. When Adam went to sleep, God took from Adam's womb and made a woman. Some of God's greatest work. <laughs> but God waited for Adam to sleep and to rest. And God does that with us. God gives us the chance to rest and be still so God can work in us. But we have to have listening ears for that. You know, sometimes we don't know what else to do and we scurry and we keep moving and we keep moving and we think we're staying out of trouble so we're staying busy and we have to be still. And the older we get, the more we learn that lesson, not because we're smarter, but because our bodies slow us down. But whatever the case is, we all have to figure out how to slow down sometimes, right? I mean, have you ever seen anyone run a race and they're running so fast they fall? You know, it's that thing. Um, and then when I look at when God is not just telling us to lay down, but God is telling us to lay down in green pastures. And I heard on the radio, someone said, yeah, for men, that's like great. You get to like eat in bed. But you lay down, you have this beautiful grass around you, this green pasture. You can feed it, sure. You can rest in it. But it is time, there are times where we have to be still, we have to be quiet, and we have to relax and let God move within us. And that's when God restores our souls. That's when God finds ways to give us peace. That's when God gives us revelation to using all of the things that we have inside of us, because we have what we need, right? We're wonderfully made in God's image already. The good stuff's already in there. We just don't always know how to use it. We just don't always know how to get to it. At the times that we need it, we have to be still and let God show us. Now, it's the time for that. Now, it's the time for you to understand this, my child. Now, it is the time for you to explore this, my child. Have you ever wondered why things happen in a certain sequence? Why didn't I know that 10 years ago? <laughs> because we weren't meant to use it and do it 10 years ago. Now is the time. The time is the time that we hear God and then respond. Sometimes we respond in action, but sometimes we 
these bodily sins. But one thing that remains the same is that we have to open for God to pour in, talk to us, hear God, and let God restore our souls. That's why this is so amazing when people, people hear this, this verse. Sometimes people have to keep saying it to themselves over and over. I know someone who used to repeat it over and over until they calmed down. It was a soothing tool for them. The Lord is my shepherd, shalom. And they just kept saying over and over and over um, as a meditative tool. And that's what worked for them. Now, some people will not be able to be still for that. Um, but it is one of those verses that I encourage you every chance you get to hear or say or read this 23rd Psalm is an opportunity for you to see how gentle and loving God is to us. How gentle and loving God has shown God's self to be for each and every one of us. No one is excluded in this. And even when life throws us curveball, we have this as one of the many things to turn to and remember. We have different times where we do things kind of wrong, we mess up, we make mistakes, we sin, uh, we, we make accidents that you know could have been avoided, we make bad decisions, or not even a bad decision, but we make the decision that didn't turn out the way we had hoped it would be. But I want to invite you to take a minute and go back to that 23rd Psalm. And you know what's so beautiful about where it's placed in the Bible? You know, when I was first learning how to read my Bible, I didn't know what to read. I left one down there, but I have one right here. I'm going to just grab it. One of the great things about the 23rd Psalm is that it's smack dab in the middle. It's super easy to find. If you can't find anything else, just open the middle of the Bible. And if you open up to Proverbs, like Psalms right in front of it. And these are all Psalms, 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 and the numbers are in order. So if you open up to Psalm 78 by accident, because it's like right in the middle, just kind of scroll back to 23. So that's one thing, it's really easy to find. Psalm 23, 20, 23, boom, right there. So that's one of the great things about Psalm 23. But when I was learning to use my Bible for myself when I was a younger person, I didn't know what to read. Have you ever experienced that or ever seen anyone who, like, they got a Bible and they're interested in it, but they don't know what to read. So that's like the first thing that I would know how to go to and find and read. And so sometimes when I had my Bible, I was in college and I had my Bible sitting there, you know, because, you know, when you go away to college, some churches, they give you this fancy Bible with your name on it. You don't know what to do with it. You don't even crack the binding, right? But you have it there because you kind of think it's a good idea. And so I would just go, well, I'm feeling kind of crummy. My mom says I should use my Bible. I don't know what else to read. I'll just read this one. And that's what I would do. And it works for everything. Sometimes you may be nervous. Sometimes you may be sad. Sometimes you may be, I mean, pick an emotion. It's one of those Bible verses that can carry you through most things. And so I encourage you as I read it one last time to listen. And then in your own time, Go check it out again. I will read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me everything I need. He lets me lie down in fields of grass green. He leads me beside quiet waters. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths for the honor of his name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. You are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff comfort me. You prepare a feast for me right in front of my enemies. You pour oil on my head, my cup runs over. I am sure that your goodness and love 
will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please stand as we prepare to sing our blessing song. Please affix your masks and sing together. My shepherd is the living God. The words are in your book. Let us pray. 
Poet God, we are your poem. What a gift that is. For a poem can hold everything. Contradictions, unanswered questions, raw wounds and beautiful scars, all with spaciousness. When a poet begins a poem, they do not know what the end will be. Rather, they follow each image given, each metaphor in line, trusting the leap trusting what flows from the pen, marveling at what emerges. I picture you marveling, poet God, observing with curiosity what has flowed after you first put your pen to paper, and trusting us with the unfolding poem of our lives. You cry with us, your tears, salt roses blooming on the page of the collective poem, because the poem writes the bare truth of the pain. We know you are with us, reading every agony. May the people of Cuba who have been experiencing some of the biggest anti-government protests in decades, feel your presence with them in their exhaustion, rage, and longing for the poem of their lives transformed to become one of freedom, equality, and economic justice for enough and for all. May the people of Haiti Feel your presence in their distress over the recent assassination of their president. May the global community have wisdom in what help is truly needed. May the poem become one of peace. May the poem, may the people of South Africa sense your steadying presence amid violent, deadly protests, riots and looting following the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma. The poem of planet Earth is hurting we pray for the communities, human and non-human, that are intensely experiencing the way we have negatively impacted our home with our resource-affecting choices. In the Western United States, as oppressive heat and fires rage on for a third week. In India, where monsoon season lightning strikes, killed dozens and injured many this week. In the United States, where Florida manatees are dying of starvation in record numbers due to polluted waters killing off their food source of seagrass. May we feel your presence in our grief, in our longing, in our fear. You weep with us. You have given us the collective creativity to rewrite a way of living upon Earth as healers. May we have the courage to live into the creativity you have given us to make real the poem we want to see. All throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen the disparity between nations and within nations in access to healthcare. We see so clearly which communities are most impacted and now who has access to the vaccine. We are not meant to live in a poem that is so out of balance. We pray for vaccine access where needed especially for the 11 countries that have only 1% of, of their population vaccinated. We pray for places around the world experiencing second, third, fourth, and fifth waves. We are daily invited to pick up the pen of our lives and co-create with you, poet God. How do we live as the poem we are created to be? We thank you, poet God, for writing us into being and continue to co-create with us. May we see that we are given all that we need in your love for the composition of our lives. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his spirit to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and may he lift up his smile on you and give you peace. Please be seated and stay seated until the post room has been completed.